family, once again we are gathered here to listen to God's word and we are thankful for all that he has done for us. And before we start, why not we start with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, thank you Father for today that we can be gathered to listen to your word Father. We know Father that you have a word to speak to us today. We know that you want to speak to us today Father. I pray, Father, for an open heart, open mind, Father. I pray, Father, whatever things that is going on in the mind of some of the elects here, Father, I pray, Father, that you will take hold of that, Father. Amen. Let them listen to your word, Father. Let them focus on your word, Father. For your word have the power to transform our life, Father. I pray, Father, for the heart of the LA family and even for whoever that is watching online, Father, I pray, Father, that they will have an open heart and open mind to listen to your word, Father. Amen. Thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name we ask and we pray. Amen. 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 So church, today I've entitled my message as The Everlasting Kingdom. I've taken this uh, sermon title from a Bible verse taken from Psalms 145 verse 13. It says this, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. His kingdom church endures forever. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And if you are from this church, you know that we have a monthly focus. We have a yearly theme. And we just entered into this pillar of authority. And we are in the month of May where we are learning about kingdom. There are so many things to learn about kingdom. And I believe today's message will really bless your heart. Amen? Last few weeks, we learned a lot about keys. Key to enter into that kingdom to enter into the kingdom. Last week, Brother Jeremy shared to us the two things. First, you need to have key first. But even if you have key, but if you have the wrong key, you still cannot enter. There are so many people who believe in Jesus, who believe in the so-called gospel, they have the key. They somehow have the key. But they do not have the right key to enter into the kingdom of God. So what is the right key? The key to enter into the kingdom of God is John chapter 3, verse 5. This is a story where Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, telling him how to be born again. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If we do not have the right key, if we are not born again of the water and the Spirit, we can never enter into the kingdom of God. No matter how much you try. Last week, Brother Jeremy bring us to that uh, inner man studio. No matter how much you try to open, you cannot open if you don't have the key. The key is so important. Even if you have the key, if you lost it, can you still enter? No, you cannot enter. What is important is we hold on to the key. We keep our faith until the end. That is the most important thing. When we keep the key tied to us, then we can enter into the kingdom of God. Or else, we can't. Amen? That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone who say to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Wow. There are so many people who call, Lord, Lord, they do a lot of wonders, they do a lot of um, things, they do a lot of charity, they cast demon, they do a lot of things. But Jesus is saying this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter, but those who does the will of my Father. So what is the will of the Father? 
Elisha, what's the will of the father? Sanctification. Yes, sanctification. Let us see this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3a. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. What is the use that God gives you so much things, so many um, houses, so many cars for you to drive, so many shoes for you to wear? One day you can only wear one shoe. How rich you are also, you can only eat how much food you can per day. You cannot say that, oh, I'm a millionaire, I'm a billionaire. Oh, I can eat 20 bu of ramen as compared to you. No, no matter how rich we are, we can only wear one shoe, we can only wear one shirt. If you wear 10 shirts, people will think you are crazy. So, it's not the matter of um, God wanted to bless you with all these material things. That comes secondary. What is most important is we know the gospel, we are safe, we have the right key, we hold on to the key. That is the most important thing. And after Jesus told the story of uh, this, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, he will go on to say that there is a parable he talked about. The builder, parable of the builder, where he will say, there are two builders. One of the builder built his house on the rock. Another builder built his house on the sand. When the wind comes, when the storm comes, those that are built on the sand, the house fell. Those who built on the rock, the house stands still. Today, our faith shouldn't be on what we do. Like those people who say, we cast out demons in your name. We do this. We fast. We pray. We come to church every day. It's not because of that. Those are sins. And it will fall if we build on that. What we need to build on is on the rock. Our yearly theme. Let us go back. I will build my church. We read here the scripture. It says, on this rock. On this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. It's on this rock, the rock solid faith that Peter had. This is the incident where Jesus is asking the people around him, who do you say I am? Some people say I'm Elijah. Some people say that I'm John the Baptist. Some people say I'm this and that. But who do you say that I am? And Peter stood up and said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus will say, blessed are you Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood does not reveal this to you, but my father revealed it to you. And on this rock, he said, Peter, I will build my church. On the rock solid faith that he had, Jesus will build his church. And we know how Peter preached the gospel, 3,000 people get saved. God used him mightily to preach the gospel because he had the rock solid faith. And after Jesus spoke about that parable, the gospel of Matthew will end that chapter with this verse. Verse 28 to 29. And so it was, when Jesus had ended this saying, which he talked about the builder, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus speaks as those who have authority. Who have authority. How can he have that authority? Because he is the king. Today, I have only two points. The king and his kingdom. My first point for today is the king. You know, every kingdom have a king. That's why it's called kingdom. If it doesn't have a king, it could have been called something else. A country, a city, or a nation. Some nation doesn't have a king. 
Indonesia doesn't have a king. Malaysia have a king. So it may differ. But a kingdom have a king. And Jesus is that king. Jesus is the king not of this world. He's the king of the everlasting kingdom. You know, uh, for a very long time, after the Israelite, they were in bondage in, uh, in Egypt and they were brought out. After that, for quite some time, they didn't have a king. And during those times, they have judge. They have judge. And when they saw that the nation around them have king, they also wanted king. They also wanted king. And they demanded a king from Samuel, the prophet. Let us read this. Israel demands a king. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his son judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his son did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Pay attention to this. It says all the elders of Israel gathered together, find this prophet Samuel and said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And if you all have read this story before, you will see that Samuel is displeased with their request. Because he said, God is your king. Why do you need a human king? Samuel went and tell God, and God said, well, if they want, give it to them. But warn them. If you have king, this will happen to you. They will demand you tax. They will exploit you. They will bully you. They will do all this kind of thing. Warn them. After that, Samuel did. Samuel warned them. Samuel warned them and they still wanted the king. And God allowed them to choose their own king. And they chose Saul to be the king. Saul was the first king of Israel. But he was not faithful. He was not faithful because God commanded him to do something, he do something else. And because of that, God anointed another king, the king that he wants, which is David. Let us see the graph so that you will understand better. After Saul died, David became the king. And then, David died. Solomon took over the reign and became the king. But Solomon was also not walking right. If you read, if you open your Bible, I want you all to open your Bible right now. Open to 1 King chapter 11. What does it say? It's just one sentence. All the verses before that, everything is so good. Solomon was reigning. Solomon was having a very good life. He built the temple. He built his palace. But when it comes to 1 King chapter 11, it is just this one verse. It says, But King Solomon loved many foreign women as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. It's just this one sentence. After that, everything go haywire. We can see that Solomon loved his wife more than God. And God actually loved Solomon so much, God warned him two times in a dream. Don't do this. Be loyal to me. Be like your father David. Be loyal to me. But he refused to listen. And he just go on his way. And true enough, God's word came to pass. God said, if you don't obey me, if you don't follow me, 
I will divide your kingdom into two. And it happened. It happened that the kingdom was divided into Rehoboam and Jeroboam. If you read the story, you, you will see that Jeroboam is actually not a son of Solomon. He's just another servant. The Bible says that he's a very industrious guy. And when Solomon saw that, wow, this guy is very industrious, he made him to be the leader. And ended up, he became the king of the northern kingdom. So this is the northern kingdom. It's divided now. Ten tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. And God keep his promise. Because of David, I will keep one tribe. These two tribes consists of Benjamin and Judah. And God kept the tribe of Judah. And that is where the ultimate king will be coming from. Jesus Christ will come from the tribe of Judah. Today, I really appreciate Joshua for choosing that song, Lion and the Lamb. Our God is the Lion of Judah. He is the king. He is the king. All this, they wanted the king is so that, you see, God's plan is so perfect. Even though they wanted that physical king, God gave his son, the ultimate king. Let us read this in Jeremiah. It says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. This is prophesying that Jesus, the king, will reign. David, a branch of righteousness, because Jesus came from the lineage of David. And it's very interesting. Last night, God gave me a very deep revelation about this lineage of Jesus. You know, we always talk about how the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, started with the ministry of John the Baptist, right? And very interestingly, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, started with the genealogy of Jesus. Let us see how Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 starts. The genealogy of Jesus, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Wow. It's just a verse, right? And what is so great about this verse? If you see the arrangement, Abraham is born way before David. Why was it said that Jesus, the son of David, then only it says the son of Abraham? Because the gospel of Matthew will portray Jesus as the king. The the Gospel of Matthew portrays the lion face of Jesus. The Gospel has four faces, which is um, the lion, we have the eagle, the man, and the ox. You can find it out. And this is the lion part. This is the kingship of Jesus. And is he the king? Yes, he is the king. When he was brought to Pilate, before he was um, crucified on the cross, Pilate asked him, are you the king? At first, Jesus will be like, why are you asking me this? Are you asking because you wanted to know or is it because someone asked you to do it? And then Jesus will say, my kingdom is not of this world and blah, blah, blah. Then he asked him again, are you then the king? And this is what Jesus said. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus is the king. That's why when he was crucified on the cross, they put like a board there stating what? Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. John chapter 19, verse 19. 
Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But there is interesting part here. Jesus is the king, but he's not the king to rule over the Roman Empire, to rule over all these people. He's the everlasting king coming from above. And his kingdom is from above. His kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. And we are entering into our second point now. His kingdom. If you remember just now, I started the sermon with a verse. It says this, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Jesus is not interested in changing the government in this world to changing the, the, the system, how the world operates. No. He's more interested in saving your soul. He's more interested in taking your sin through his baptism through the laying out of hands by John the Baptist, dying for you, rose again, so that he can give his Holy Spirit to you, to indwell in you, so that you can live that new life in him. He's more interested in that part. He's not so interested in giving you a new car, new job, new house, and all this thing. No. He is more interested in your spiritual man who is dead. When... Adam fell into sin. He actually, what he did was, he rightfully gave his authority to the devil. And this is the reason why Jesus needs to die. Because he cannot just be unjust and like, just because he's God, he can do whatever he wants. He still follows the protocol. He still think our sin rightfully by through the laying on of hands by John the Baptist died for us, rose again to give us a new life. He did not just say something to save us. He did everything that needs to be done so that we can be redeemed. Amen? And as what I said just now, when Pilate asked him whether you are the king, Jesus answered this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servant would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not of here. Jesus is not so interested in the worldly kingdom. He's more interested in the everlasting kingdom. Amen? And that's why when Satan, after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, the next day he went to the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit. And Satan tempted him three times. And the last temptation was this. Let us read. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. But what did Jesus say? Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. The devil, Satan, who tempted Jesus, he said, I will give you all this kingdom if you bow down to me. But Jesus wasn't interested in this kingdom. He's more interested in the everlasting kingdom. Amen? So now we know that Jesus is the king. He has a kingdom. But his kingdom is not of this world. And that kingdom, this kingdom, from now onwards, uh, LA family, please listen very carefully because this part is the one that I really want to speak to you all. In his kingdom, we have a kingdom culture. My sub point for the second part is 
kingdom culture. Psalms 119 verse 160, it says this, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgment endures forever. It says, the entirety of God's word is truth. There is no lie in God's word. Everything is true. Every one of your righteous judgment endures forever. Everyone say with me, forever? Forever? forever. His kingdom reigns forever. His word is truth. Remember this graph that I showed you all? I want to focus on this guy, Jeroboam, who does not follow the kingdom culture. And there was a chaos during his reign. There's a lot of things happening. He didn't walk according to the ways of the Lord. And I want you all to pay attention. Let us read the story together. Whatever that is written in red is the main point. Let us take it down, all right? Jeroboam's gold cows. Then Jeroboam built Sechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also, he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, remember, there were two kings, right, just now? Let us see. Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam is on the northern side. Rehoboam is on the southern side. Now, let us continue. It says here, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now, the kingdom may return to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of these people will turn back to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. His authority, his position is at stake now because he knows that he's not from the royal family. He's just some random servant who has been given this opportunity to reign. So he's afraid. Now let us see what he does. Eh? Therefore, the king asked advice. Made two calves of gold and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people to worship before the one as far as Dan. So what happened was, he made two calves of gold. Because he said, it is too much for you to go up to, to Jerusalem. Why go so far? Just worship here. Just worship here. I make you your God. Nah. This is the God that bring you out of Egypt. Let us continue. This is the first part. Huh? Please take note of this red color word. Made two calves of gold. He made shrine on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And at Bethel, he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. Now, the first thing he does was, he made two calves of gold. The second thing that he does is, he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. This is the second point. And the red one here, which will be repeated later, we can see. Let us continue. So he made offering on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month. In the month 
which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar of burnt incense. So these three things, let us see. The sin of Jeroboam, he did not follow what God actually wanted. Firstly, he made two golden calves. Secondly, he made priests from every class of people who were not of the son of Levi. Thirdly, he changed the day of the sacrificial system. Why is it so sinful? Golden calves only what? Changing priests only what? Changing the date only what? The kingdom of God is an everlasting kingdom. Remember when I shared just now, when I start this point, I said, the entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgment endures forever. And I remember you guys said the word forever, right? His word is truth forever. And God actually, when Moses was on the Mount Sinai, God gave him the two tablets and the first commandment was this. Don't have other God. When you make two golden calves, you already break the first commandment. Let us see. I'm going to give you a comparison on these three things and we're going to see how it implies in today's term. Let us see. The first one uh, made two golden calves. This is God's command. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of the bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. This was the command. You shall have no other gods before me. But what did King Jeroboam did? Verse 28, Therefore the king asked advice, made two calves of gold, and said to the people, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from land of Egypt. Is the golden calf the one that brought them up of the land of Egypt? No, it's the Lord. It's the Yahweh God who brought them out. But they made the golden calves and said that, this is the God that brought you out. That is the first sin that King Jeroboam did. And the second thing, Numbers chapter 3 verse 10. This is God's appointment to appoint the Levites as the high priest and the priests. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons that they may keep their priesthood. But the layman who comes near shall be put to death. What did they do? He made shrine on the high place and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Then you may ask me, Ern, it doesn't tally. Why are you talking about the sons of Levi here? Why are you talking about Aaron and his son? Let us read the whole context. Because it's too long if I'm going to put the whole thing here. Let us read the whole thing. Numbers chapter 3, verse 5 to 10. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Bring the tribe of Levi forward and present them before Aaron the priest that they may serve him. They shall perform the duties for him and for the whole congregation in front of the tent of meeting to do the service of the tabernacle. They shall also take care of all the furnishing of the tent of meeting, along with the duties of the sons of Israel to do the service of the tabernacle. So you shall assign, assign who? Assign who? You shall assign the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are exclusively... The Bible says they are exclusively assigned to him from the sons of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons 
that they may keep their priesthood, but laymen who come near shall be put to death. If you go back to the history, if you read, you will find out that even Aaron is from the tribe of Levite. And God said what? God said, only take the Levites, all those from the tribe of Levites. But what did Jeroboam did? He took every class of people who were not of Levites. Every class of people who were not of Levi. Wow. This is the second thing he do. Let's go to the last one. This is God's command in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your soul and do not work at all whether a native or your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. If you read further, you will notice that this is actually the day of atonement. Because if you read, this is verse 29, right? Verse 31, it will say that um, this is the statute forever where you will do this every year. But what did he do? So he made offering on the altar which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the 8th month. In the month which he had devised in his own heart. Whose own heart? Jeroboam's own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burned incense. Wow. In today's term, they have different calendar. Like I'm not sure. They don't call it July or August kind of thing. Seven month is like, if I tell it in today's term, is 10th of July. Let's say God set it on 10th of July. But they did it on 15th of August. Is it the same date? <laughs> it's different date, right? And this is what they did. Even back then, even back then. Now the question is, how does this relate to us? and you're talking so much about Old Testament, I don't know how it relates to us. They made two golden calves for their convenience. Why? Because they said, it is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Why not just do church online, Ern? Why you need to come to church? Just make God for us in our house la. more convenient what there are so many people now are making golden calves they don't want to abide they don't want to come to church anymore because they think that it is too much trouble if you read it in the New Living Translation that phrase that verse it will say that it is too much trouble for you to go to Jerusalem. It is too much trouble to come to church all the way from Semenye, all the way from Sungai Long, all the way from, I don't know where you stay. <laughs> but you know it all. It's not convenient, right? It's going against our own will. It's going against our own desire. It's not that convenient to go to Jerusalem. Why go so far? No need lah. Just, Worship God in your house. Just do it for your own convenience. But is that how church is run? Maybe you may be thinking, Allah earn. You know, in the Old Testament, even like a few hundred years ago, they don't have phone. They don't have internet. They cannot make use of their resources. That's why they have to get it. But now we have all this resource. We can. We can make use of it. Why waste all of these resources? Why come all the way from so far? Waste petrol? No need la. All these are old school thought. We do church our way. Wow. That's what Jeroboam did, isn't it? It is too much trouble. Too much trouble. For them, 
to go to Jerusalem. That's why they make that golden calves. We want our convenience. How many of you love convenience store? Very easy, right? Just go there, buy food, come out, buy one Maggie, buy. Very convenience. But that's not how church runs. It's not for our convenience. That's why, why, why the Bible needs to say that do not forsake the gathering of the same. If church can be done online, why gather? No point. If Jesus can die online, easy what? He no need to suffer what? The word of God endures forever and it does not change with the passing of time. It may be 2,000 years ago, but it still applies today. That's why he said his word is the truth. His word is the truth. We shouldn't fall into this culture of convenience, taking our fast path, thinking that I can do whatever I want. This is what King Jeroboam did what? Because he feel that there is too much trouble to worship God at Jerusalem. And today's term is too much trouble to come to church, worship Him, ah, playing again. Ah. Coming to church again. Ah. Bible study. Ah. Very jam. Lah, eh? I just recently moved house very far. We have a lot of excuse. But we shouldn't take that path. This is a warning that God is giving to us. You are not one safe forever safe. Huh? You need to abide. And let us see the second point. They made priests from every class of the people who were not of the son of Levi. The first one was they wanted their own convenience. The second one is they wanted to add their human thoughts and philosophy. Why do I say this? They feel like, okay, what? Why need to be Levi only? Anyone can be what? What happened to Korah when he rebelled against Moses? Yeah, God swallowed him with those who want to go against him. This is talking about going against the leadership of God with our human thought, with our human carnal thought, and say that, Anyone can preach what? As long as I'm born again, I can preach what? Yes, but you need to be qualified. You need to know your stuff before you can preach. Or else you will mislead others. And the Bible says the judgment is far much greater if you are a teacher of the word. That's why we don't paddle the word of God. That's why God has made it so clear that only one tribe, don't allow any other people to do it. If you allow any other people, they will do it another way. You may think like, why only pastor can be the pastor? Why only pastor assigning only these three leaders? Why not all of us can be leaders? Oh yes, that's your human thought. God calls different people. What happened to um, Naaman? Naaman the leper, he also had his own thought. He had leprosy, you know. And then there's a young girl who told him that, hey, you go and find this uh, servant of God at Samaria. He can heal you. He find Elisha. Then Elisha said, oh, go to that river Jordan dip yourself seven times, then you'll be okay. What did he say? Ha! Huh? Jordan River? That's the dirtiest river here. Can't we find any other river somewhere near here? Is there no river around here? That's his human thought. He adds on to what the servant of God is saying. The servant of God says, go to Jordan River. Dip yourself seven times. That's the command. But of course, at the end, someone persuaded him and then he humbled himself and he went. 
But if the case when he do not go, do you think he will be healed? No. If he do not go, which means he do not have the right key anymore. He's bringing a wrong key. Can he now be cleansed? No. If we bring the wrong key, we cannot, we cannot enter. We cannot be healed. The only way out is to believe in the gospel of God's righteousness. Jordan River, that's where everything happened. That's where all our sin were taken. That's where John the Baptist lay his hand. Why Levi is so important? Because John the Baptist is the last high priest from the Aaronic household. And he is also from the Levite tribes. And he has all the credentials to pass his sin. Not only his sin, but the worst sin upon Jesus. That's why he's the last. Because Jesus is the ultimate one that will take the sin of the world. And he passed the sin. Jesus walked three years. He died. He rose again. Today we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because we believe in the truth. Because we believe in what he has done. Amen? So, do not add on to our human thought and philosophy and question the leadership of God. Do not question why only the Levite. That is what God said. And we are going to follow on that. We're going to follow and say, God, if you say this is the church that you are building, I am staying here. Amen. I'm staying here. I want to keep my faith. I know that apart from you, I'm nothing. I know that I cannot walk this faith alone. I need my brother and sister. I need the fellowship. I need the encouragement. I need each other. Help me. No matter what devil put on you, remember, if there is any thought that is going against the leadership of God, like what Brother Jeremy shared just now, if you are going against Jesus, it's okay, you know. But if you are going against the Holy Spirit who is working through Jesus, you are blaspheming Him. This church is not built by Pastor Paul. This church is built by Jesus. Amen. And we are going to hold on to that. Amen. And the third one, change the day of sacrificial system. It's talking about flexibility. Talking about changing of days, right? I feel like, wow, okay what? It's just one month away, what, from 7 of, no, from 10th of July to 15th of August. It's just one month, five days difference, what? But for God, it was very important. He set that day specifically. We cannot say that, earn, you're being too lawful. Why need to come to church every Sunday? Why Sunday? Can come to church anytime I want what? On demand, online service. I can watch anytime I want. I can watch online service when I'm driving. I can watch online service when I'm cooking. Flexibility. They want to change the time of the service. But is that how God works? God has set one day for us. The Sabbath day. The holy day for Him. We should not change it for our own flexibility because we think that very easy to wake up early, very hard to wake up in the morning on Sunday. It's too much trouble. It's too much trouble. It's too far away. Why? Why Wednesday also need to come? This church is too demanding. I don't like it. Then you are falling here already. Human thought and philosophy. You don't want to abide in the church of God. You want your flexibility. You want your convenience. You want to change. If the word of God <laughs> changes, I wouldn't want to believe in it. I believe in this word because this word does not change. And this is the only rock that is immovable. And we need to hold on to this. Don't, don't compromise the gospel. Don't 
uh, blend in to the people of the world. You know, sometimes, time to time, when we do that too much, right, we will be part of them. We lose our testimony. For our own convenience, we add our own human thought, philosophy, for our own flexibility. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is it too much trouble? Is it too much trouble to serve him? For them, it is too much trouble. But for us who are born again of the gospel of God's righteousness, Jesus took our sin. He, he's being judged for our sin. That is much more trouble compared to what we are going through today. It's not a trouble. When we are living in the Spirit, when we abide in Him, we know that it is a joy to come to church. We know that this is where we are fed. We hunger for the Word of God because you know that this is the only place that you can be strengthened and encouraged. Amen? With that, I have ended my message. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.